Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to an introduction into who we are and ultimately who we are called to be. Welcome to the recalibration of the Spirit. As we wind down this sermon series, we're brought all the way back to the beginning in Genesis. Then God said, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I want to remind you, that's chapter 1. And what verse is it? Is it verse 1? Verse 26, 25 verses before, right? But here we are in this series, Made to Worship, and it all comes from that song, Before the Day, Before the Light, Before the World Revolved Around the Sun, God on high stepped down into time and wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder so that we always remember that you and I were made to worship. That you and I are called to love, that you and I are forgiven and free. You and I embrace surrender, and you and I choose to believe, and you and I will see who we were meant to be. And so as we have every Sunday in this series, we revisit the question, what if, what if we were truly made to worship? What if it's our surrender and ultimately our worship that becomes a gateway into our purpose in this life? and to all that we were called to be. So I'll ask you, as I have every week, what is the definition of worship? Goodness. The feeling or expression of reverence or adoration to God. God God-centric, God-focused, and ultimately God-honoring. And Paul describes it in Romans 12. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you. God develops a well-formed maturity in you. And I'm speaking out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in pure grace, It's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. Those are the powerful words of Paul who never, never gives it to us lightly. You and I were made to worship from the very moment that we entered this world. Some of us kicking and screaming, others of us calmly. To our exit from this world where we take that last breath and exultation, a praise to God. It's true that our lives, our very lives, sing a praise to God. But what does that look like? What does that praise actually look like? Well, friends, at the end of the day, that's up to you. What it looks like, what it sounds like, and ultimately what it feels like. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever been, like, thirsty? Like, really, really thirsty? Like, wake up in the middle of the night, and your mouth is so dry that your lips are chapped? 
and you're just <sighs> gasping for water, or maybe after a long walk or run. Nobody? Goodness, I like hydrated people. But that's what dehydration feels like. Like you're just crawling your way to get an ounce or a drop of water. And the symptoms of dehydration are thirst, a feeling of intense thirst is the first sign of dehydration. And then your mouth, right? Dry lips, dry tongue, and then a headache. Headache can be a huge symptom of dehydration. And then tiredness, when your body just feels weak, you're just over it. Confusion. Dehydration can cause mental fatigue, confusion, or an overall lack of energy. I think we've all been there. And then there's irritability. A lack of patience or just a general sense of frustration. You ever been there? I don't know about you, but when I think about that list of things, I think about, well, it pretty much happens every single day. And I don't think that my body is dehydrated. Matter of fact, I know it isn't. But I think it's my spirit that's dehydrated. And I think if you're honest with yourself, yours is too. I think there's a deep thirst in our souls for something more nourishing for something more satisfying than what we encounter in this world. I think our mouths dry up at the repeated sound of our own voices echoing things that we don't really believe, surrounded by people we really don't care about. And I think our heads, well, they begin to ache at the thought of more pointless interactions in this race that we call life. And I think we're tired in our spirits and we're weak, distant from that source of life. I think we're confused and fatigued in the face of this never-ending grind of life over and over and over and over again, pursuing things that we don't really care about. And I think we're just over it sometimes. You raise your hand if you're just over it sometimes. <sighs> yeah. And rightfully so. Rightfully so, we honor that feeling. We've become so consumed with living our earthly lives that our spiritual lives have suffered. Would you raise your hand if you say, that's true for you? But here's the thing. The real problem is that we even draw that line of distinction between our earthly lives and our spiritual lives. There is no difference. If our spirits are dehydrated, if our very souls are yearning for more, a craving a God that we haven't encountered, we're not living a life of worship, are we? It's neither God-centric, nor God-focused, nor God-honoring, and yet here we are. But you see, Jesus had a far different idea of what that life should look like, of what it really means to be nourished in our spirits. And that's when some of the people of Jerusalem said, isn't this the one that they were out to kill? And he's here, just out in the open, saying whatever he pleases, and no one's stopping him. Could it be that the rulers, in fact, know that he's the Messiah? And yet we know where this man came from. The Messiah is going to come out of nowhere. No one is going to know where he comes from. And that, that provoked Jesus, who was teaching in the temple, to cry out, yes, you think, you think that you know me and where I'm from, but that's not where I'm from. I didn't set myself up in business. My true origin is from the one who sent me, and you do not know him at all. I come from him, and that's how I know him. He sent me here. They were looking for a way to arrest him, but not a hand was laid on him because it wasn't yet God's time. And many from the crowd committed themselves in faith, saying, 
Will the Messiah, when he comes, provide better or more convincing evidence than than this? And the Pharisees, alarmed at this undertow that was going through the crowd, teamed up with the high priest and sent their police to arrest him. And Jesus rebuffed them and he said, I'm only with you for a short time. And then I go on to the one who sent me. And you will look for me, but you won't find me. Where I am, you can't come. And then the Jews put their heads together. Where do you think that he's going to go that we won't be able to find him? Do you think he's about to travel to the Greek world to teach the Jews? What is he talking about anyway? You will look at me, but you won't find me. And where I go, you can't come. And on the final and climactic day of the feast, well, Jesus took the stand. And he cried out, anyone who thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will brim and spill out of the depths for anyone who believes in me this way. Just as the scripture says. And he said this in regard to the spirit whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The spirit had yet been given because Jesus had not been glorified. And those in the crowd who heard the words were saying, this has to be the prophet. And others said, he is the Messiah. But others, others were saying, the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Don't the scriptures tell us that the Messiah comes from David's line and from Bethlehem, David's village? And so there was a split right in the middle of the crowd. Some went so far as to wanting to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. You know, my friends, this is one of those passages that we read and we just gloss over because we think, We think we understand it. But the truth is, we don't always see what's right in front of our face. Jesus is right there, plain as day, standing right before them. And what do they do? They mock him. And they say, who is this crazy man? He's not the one. I know he wouldn't look like that. I know he wouldn't talk like that. I know he wouldn't stand up there and babble. I know this guy. He is not the one. Jesus is right there proclaiming the good news, standing in the glory of God, and still, still the crowd is divided. You see, some realize that he's the Messiah, but so many others, well, they just can't get out of their own way. You know, when we hear stories like this, if we're honest, we're dumbfounded, right? How could they not see that it's Jesus? He had the hair and the beard, and I'm sure he was glowing, and he was a tall guy, right? How could they not know that it was Jesus? We're shocked at this idea that people don't recognize the Son of God standing right before them, and we we see ourselves as the people that do, right? The people that are falling on their knees saying, this is the prophet, this is the Messiah, I see you, Jesus. But the truth is we don't, do we? The truth is we come to worship and we encounter God, and yet the God we find, well, that God is never good enough for us. Well, my God would never show up while they were playing that music. You know, my God is way more liberal than the God that they're talking. My God is conservative, and I don't agree with anything they said today. Well, my God, he'd be a little bit taller than that little bitty Jesus they had there. Or here's the worst. Here I am, still waiting for my God to show up. Where you at? I'm here. And my friends, we say all of that. Whether we say it out loud or we say it in our spirit, we do all of that posturing in the presence of God as God walks among us asking nothing, nothing of us but to show up. 
with whatever we have. Whatever burdens that we're carrying, whatever brokenness that we hold, just to show up. We stand before a Jesus that says, bring your thirsty spirit. Bring it. And I promise that I'll fill you up from the inside out. Just show up. But the moment that we find something better, the moment that it gets a little inconvenient, we just bail. I don't know who that was today, but it was not my God. I'm going to brunch next week. My friends, I can't say that I have all the answers because I don't. But I do know this, that life shouldn't be so exhausting. It just shouldn't. Life shouldn't be so draining to our spirits and life. It just shouldn't be so frustrating. And the only reason The only reason that it is is because we refuse, we refuse to hand it over. We refuse to surrender and acknowledge that God stands before us. And here's the truth, friends, if you came in search of it. If we don't bow humbly before God, eventually we will end up bowing in brokenness. That choice is ours. When God stands among us, will you recognize God? Or will you keep searching for something more? My friends, I pray that we have hearts that that pour out adoration and praise to the God that holds us, to the God that blesses us, and the God that carries us forward, and that our praise might not be silent or bashful in any way, but that it might ring out to the heavens above. My friends, I pray that we might have the courage, each and every one of us, to be the change that God wants to see and ultimately develop into all that God has called us to be. That we might be God-centric in our lives, God-focused with our actions and God-honoring with the love that we pour out. And that maybe, just maybe, through worship and through that gateway of love, we'll discover who we were meant to be. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you'll be changed from the inside out. It's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people that are bringing this goodness to God. No. God brings it all to you. And the only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are, and what we do for God. And my friends, as you seek to fix all of the problems in this world and encounter love and hope and ultimately the grace of God, never forget that it's you, each and every one of you, that is the solution. And that when you surrender to the call on your life, you will find freedom. And in that freedom, you'll find love. And in love, there is and there shall always be God. Thanks These be to God. Are your thoughts, potato. This is the hope of God set free. These are your thoughts, potato.